Um, if you got uh, your Bibles, open up to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, we're going to continue our talk uh, on uh, uh, the uh, doctrine of salvation. Uh, so far we've looked at six uh, different uh, areas of that, of that doctrine. Uh, we're going to continue that tonight with the seventh one and then uh, probably finish it up, uh, Lord willing, next week. Uh, but so far, uh, first, uh, can you click me there, Peyton? Uh, the first one we looked at, the first couple we looked at, we looked at regeneration. Uh, and again, remember, regeneration is to be, to be given or imparted life. Uh, again, it's the idea of uh, being born again. Uh, and uh, so to generate or produce anew, to reproduce, it refers to the life and nature a person receives when he is born again and made a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> then we talked about what happens uh, after regeneration. So these are a bunch of things that, that go into uh, what happens after a person's regenerated. You are justified. You're pronounced righteous. It's a legal and judicial act where God declares the believer righteous in Christ. Uh, then we get uh, adopted into his family. Uh, refers to God placing a believer uh, as an heir into his family and giving him access to all the privileges that go with it. Uh, then we talked about imputation. Um, it's to put something on a person's account or charge to attribute or reckon something uh, to an individual. Uh, again, uh, the idea there is uh, what we were imputed onto us in, in our first birth uh, was sin, the sin of Adam. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, that needed to get taken care of. The second Adam came, and when we accept Christ and we are regenerated, uh, we are imputed with uh, his righteousness. Um, next thing is propitiation. Uh, that's to appease or satisfy someone, to make amends for a wrong uh, that has been committed. Uh, so, again, the way that was done... Uh, via uh, the cross was through a sacrifice. Of course, it was the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the blood that he spilt. And then, of course, last week we talked about uh, reconciliation. It's to be brought from enmity to friendship, to bring peace where there was once hatred and uh, strife. Uh, so again, um, uh, that reconciliation uh, is uh, what uh, we, we were enemies of Christ, uh, enemies of the Father, and we needed to be reconciled uh, back to the Father. Uh, again, all of these things that we've talked about uh, were all done uh, and, and directly uh, uh, applied to us uh, through uh, Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Okay, I know we are not that many in here, but we can at least try to sound like we sound like... Amen? All right, good. Much better. Uh, okay, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, redemption, redemption. Okay, so redemption. Uh, what that means is to purchase or buy back something that originally belonged to the purchaser. Uh, so obviously, the, this is a very key uh, thing to understand because you know we were sold into sin. Uh, man uh, was originally uh, 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 man originally belonged, if you will, to to God. Uh, who created man, we got sold into sin at the sin of Adam. And then what redemption is, what, what, was, what was redeemed was, uh, 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 was us as we were redeemed back to the Father. But of course, in redemption, the, you know, one of the key components of redemption is understand that there had to be a purchase price. There was, a, there was something that was in that redemption uh, that had to purchase uh, what, uh, what, what that person back. And of course, we know that what that was uh, in, in uh, Christianity was, was the blood of Christ, right? That's what, what, what it was that, that purchased us back. So again, uh, all the more reason why it's important to make sure we understand uh, the importance of the blood. Um, so concerning salvation, it refers to the death of Christ where he buys back the sinner. Uh, again, as I already stated, his blood being the payment. Redemption is the foundation of salvation. It is the basis of the seven previous doctrines that we have 
uh, talked about. Before God could provide eternal salvation to anyone, he had to pay the ransom required to release the sinner from his sins. Uh, God could not decree salvation on demand. And I think that's very important that you hear what I just said. God could not decree salvation on demand. He literally had to buy it back. That, so important to understand that because um, something had to be done. God just couldn't sit back and go, okay, man's free of sin. It, it places the importance of us understanding what sin really is, how important we understand what sin is, and that, uh, uh, you know, in, in all the infant, in, in all that the Lord is, in all that he can and cannot do, uh, we have to understand, there, you know, we, we, we will often say that the Lord can't do something. Or, 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 you know, there's nothing the Lord can't do. And we got to be a little bit careful of that because there, are, there is certain things the Lord can't do. The Lord can't lie, okay? Uh, the Lord can't commit sin, <laughs> okay? So there are certain things that the Lord uh, can't do. Uh, and and in, in the realm of that, one thing that he could not do uh, was just decree uh, salvation to man. Uh, he had to literally uh, do something uh, to pay the price that sin demanded. Now, the reason why I think that's so important to understand, uh, because it kind of answers the question of, um, you know, does God send people to hell? Of course, the answer to that question is no. We send ourselves to hell because he paid the price so that we wouldn't have to go there, right? Um, you know, so uh, again, it's just an important part of redemption that we need to understand. So, Let's talk a little bit about some of these things that fall under this realm of the doctrine of redemption. Why man needs redemption. Why man needs redemption. Another result of Adam eating from the tree of knowledge is that he sold himself to sin, right? We've, we've kind of been talking about that already. He knew that his disobedience would bring death, uh, but he decided that he would rather die with Eve than live with God. We know that from a passage that Paul wrote to Timothy where he says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam fully knew what he was doing when he ate of that uh, uh, fruit of that tree. As mentioned before, Adam's sin did not only affect him, it also affected all of his descendants, uh, i.e. the uh, the one we talked about, imputation, it's the imputation of sin right? That, that was uh, 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 given to all man. The sinful nature he got when he ate uh, is passed uh, on to all of humanity. Therefore, every person on earth is hopelessly bound to sin, as well as to sin's father, uh, i.e. Satan, John eight forty four. 44. Uh, and unless he is redeemed by someone who is not bound to it, he will die and spend eternity in hell paying for his, sin, his sins himself. So, okay, what, what, what we just said there obviously is important, right? So, uh, again, unless he is redeemed, unless man is bought back by someone who is not bound to sin, that is the fate of man. Okay, so, again, that's, the, that's why we say that uh, God really doesn't send anybody to hell. Okay, God is a righteous God. He had to pronounce judge on the very, uh, judgment on the very thing that was uh, completely against him. It, it's, it's, it's in his perfect nature uh, of righteousness uh, to be able to do that. Okay? But only somebody who, who could be righteously judged the sin could be the one to buy back the person that was in sin. It it's really is a fascinating conundrum, <laughs> to really, really ponder what God did and, and to understand why he had to do it. Uh, it really is a, a pretty uh, uh, amazing story. When we talk about amazing grace, it truly is. Uh, God saw man's pitiful condition and according to his great love and grace, devised a redemption plan to buy him back from his iniquity. 
Titus uh, 2, 14 tells us that who, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people that are zealous for good works. The climax of this plan was the sending of his son to earth to give his life uh, as uh, the ransom. Matthew 20, uh, verse 28 tells us, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the main reason the Word became flesh. If Jesus came to earth but failed to die a redemptive death, his whole ministry uh, would have been in vain. No matter what else he may have done, all the healings, all the miracles, all the stuff that goes with that, man would still be in his sins under a curse and bound for hell. Galatians 3, uh, 10 through 13 tells us, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the books of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So again, uh, we understand that uh, Christ, uh, the, 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 the law pronounced a penalty on sin. It was the curse that was pronounced. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, somewhere in that area right there, you're going to find uh, the, the, the judgment that was pronounced on, on man, on woman, on Satan, on all, 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 all of, of the earth, uh, because sin entered into the world, death being the primary uh, problem there. Uh, death from two fronts, physical and spiritual death, right? So uh, man got, a, in effect, on that day, sold into sin. Sin became man's master. Okay, so uh, the only way that that could be uh, remedied, if you will, uh, was by the redemption uh, that where, where Jesus bought us back from sin and the price that had to be paid was blood because, you know, you go back to what happened when, when, when man ate of that tree. Blood started to course through the veins of Adam and that, that, that blood was uh, tainted blood, sin blood that was going to lead to death. There, therefore, it had to be the just blood of Jesus that took care of the problem. Amen? Amen. All right. That God would go to such great lengths to redeem his enemy... Uh, shows the extent of the love and compassion he has for us. Christ is the giver. Christ is the gift. Christ is the offer and the offering. He's the redeemer and the, redemp the, the redemption. Only through him can a person be freed from his bondage to sin and death. That is obviously very important to understand, right? I think we would, we would understand that. We would know that. But you know, obviously, when you're driving down the street and you say, you see the little thing that says coexist, right? And you talk about all these different religions in the world. Listen, what the world doesn't understand when, when, when we follow uh, uh, those other religions is that Allah didn't pay the price for sin. Amen. Buddha didn't pay the price for sin. You understand? None of these people paid the price for sin. Sin had a price and it had to be paid for. And that's why it's so very important for people to understand that religion can't save anybody. Uh, uh, it's only by Christ could someone be saved. And, and obviously we know that. Um, uh, the, the, the Bible very specifically tells us that, right? Acts 4.12 tells us that there's no other name uh, uh, among, uh, uh, in heaven given among men whereby we, what? Must be saved. And of course, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So again, uh, everyone uh, that is born into this world is in need of redemption. Everyone is. Only one could say that he wasn't in, ne in need of it, right? Uh, hence the reason why the one had to come into the world, amen? Uh, our natural condition is, is characterized by guilt. 
Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, uh, uh, Paul very, very uh, emphatically lays this out where he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Right in those uh, four verses right there, you see all kinds of, of words that we've already discussed in the doctrine of salvation, right? You, you see a bunch of them right there. And, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, Romans, obviously, you know, that's the book. Paul wrote that book uh, with the idea of, of, of helping us understand what biblical salvation really is. But going back to redemption, uh, Christ's redemption uh, has freed us from all guilt. And to that we should say, amen. amen. Uh, again, uh, just to make sure we understand that if we are going to have a, uh, a situation where, and this is why it's so important to understand what words actually mean. I told you this last week, uh, obviously, when we, were talking, when we were looking at reconciliation. Because if you understand what the word actually means and get the biblical definition of it, then you start to be able to look at what some other people teach on salvation and go, wait a minute, <laughs> That can't be right because it completely destroys what that word means. Okay, so I.E., uh, and again, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm just trying to lay out some truth here, right? Listen, if you take the blood out of the message, if the blood doesn't uh, pay for the sins of mankind, then redemption should not be in the Bible because that's what redemption is. There, the, the, the very meaning of the word redeemed is buy back by, with a purchase. Something had to purchase it, okay? And, okay, what people like John MacArthur will say is, well, it was his death that purchased it. And, and that would be fine if the Bible actually said that. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says specifically that the purchase price was the blood. Okay, so that can't be right because the Bible's very clear. What purchased the church? The blood, okay? And, and let, just so we're, we're clear on this to make sure that I'm not uh, making, uh, making this up, <laughs> and you know I'm not, right? Look at Leviticus 17.11 tells us that the life of the flesh is in the in the what? In the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Okay, so if you take blood out of it, you've got a problem. That's what it was that was used to purchase. Now again, uh, so blood not only represents life, it is actually physical life itself. Before God would accept an animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, a priest had to apply its blood on an altar in behalf of the offer, offerer. The death of the sacrifice alone could not atone for the offerer's sin. I, I want you to understand that and see that. Okay? And it's not that I'm trying to be a jerk against uh, 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 someone else. <laughs> okay? I'm just trying to say what they're saying is wrong. That is incorrect, okay? Uh, what's his name there, Charles Stanley? No, not Charles Stanley, Andy Stanley. Charles Stanley was fine. He got it right. Andy Stanley, did, I'm sorry. And the reason why I'm bringing these people up because a lot of people follow John MacArthur and a lot of people follow Andy Stanley. And the problem is, you go listen. I, I, li I literally listened to him come out of their own mouths say that it wasn't the blood. It was his death. That's wrong. I'm sorry, but that is incorrect. Okay? Uh, the death uh, uh, and, uh, of the sacrifice alone could not atone for the offerer's sin. The priest must apply something very specific to complete the redemption. And what it was that he had to apply was the blood. Again, the Old Testament sacrifices cannot 
take away sin, i.e., uh, the doctrine of propitiation. The shedding and application of animal blood, which the Old Testament so vividly describes, is only a picture of Christ's blood, which uh, will take away uh, sin. Uh, so I had to turn to Hebrews 10, and I wanted to... Uh, so really, truthfully, chapter 9, 10, and 11 probably are worth all reading in context. But certainly chapter 10 talks about what we're talking about right now. So let's, let's just go ahead and read. I'm probably going to read maybe the first uh, 10 verses. But I just want you to look at the emphasis that's put on the blood, just to make sure we're clear. For the law, it says in, in, in verse 1, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So again, what, 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 what was it that he's saying could not take away sin? The blood of the animals. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So again, uh, he, he, he told us, is the, the blood could not, of animals, could not take away sin. Now, you don't need to turn there, but just to, to kind of jump on it a little bit, uh, you know, Revelation chapter number one uh, tells us in verse number five, it says that from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings on the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. What? Anybody know? In his own blood. Okay? So, again, you can't take the blood out of the message. The blood of Christ can redeem sinners for at least three reasons. Number one, it does not have any taint of sin in it. Hence the reason why, you see, okay, now listen, if you take the blood out, okay, you're, you're really nullifying the whole point of a virgin birth. The whole point why he had a virgin birth was so that he would not have tainted man's blood. You understand? That was the whole point, okay? So uh, the Lord did not inherit a sinful nature from Adam as everyone else because a person's nature comes from his father. Since God is Christ's father, he has the nature of the father. Adam's sin corrupted his blood and caused his death. The last Adam, Christ, knew no sin, uh, and his blood was incorruptible. First Peter uh, chapter number one uh, says this, for as much as you know that you are not, now, now look, wa look, watch what it says here, point blank, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver, gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. What was the redemption price? But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. End of story. Nothing more to talk about. The redemption price was the precious blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay? So we can't get that off the table. The blood that flowed through his veins was his father's. Uh, and, and since he is God, manifest in the flesh, he could be... Uh, no less. Acts 20 verse 28 obviously tells us, uh, you know, our, this whole entity that we call the church, 
it literally says here, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased. Okay, where, why, why, why is, he, why is uh, uh, Luke wording it that way? Why does he say purchased? What's in mind, obviously, is what word? Redemption. Because what was per how was the church of God purchased with his own blood? Okay, did, 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 I don't want to beat it. I mean, we, we good with that? We got it? This is why the blood's so very uh, important. Uh, the application of the blood. Since God is a spiritual and eternal being, his blood has a spiritual and eternal application to the believer. There is more to Christ's blood than the physical components that were seen at the crucifixion. For it still exists and is available to all, but is only applied to those who receive him. You cannot get Christ's blood without getting him. They are inseparable. Y'all got that? Okay. The moment a person believes on Christ, Christ literally washes him from his sins with his blood. Uh, i.e. Revelation 1.5, which I already read. What else happens in there is it cleanses his soul from all sin. 1 John uh, 1, seven tells us, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one another, and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin and supplying him with an eternal redemption. So again, what happens when a person believes on Christ when they are regenerated, they are washed uh, in his sins with his blood, uh, washed from his sins in his blood, his soul gets cleansed from all sin, and we are supplied with eternal redemption. Okay, why is that important? Obviously, because obviously people will teach you you can lose your salvation. You understand? But the problem is, if the blood applies eternal redemption, how can you lose your salvation? You know, there's a problem there, obviously. Uh, Hebrews 9, 12 uh, lets us in on this fact, where it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once onto the holy place, having obtained, what does that say right there? Eternal redemption for us. Okay. I might not be the smartest guy in the world, but I can say this. I can read pretty well. That's what it says. Okay, what, what, what was it that obtained eternal redemption for us? His blood did. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to be funny. What I am trying to say is, though, let's, th let's walk that through for a minute. Let's really think about that, okay? Because what uh, folks will say is that uh, we can, if they're trying to teach the idea that you can lose your salvation, uh, what they'll say about that is that, you know, that we can uh, uh, do something that will, will get us out of the favor of the Father. You know, what's funny is when you talk to folks that, 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 that will believe that, they never really can pinpoint what the something is. I've often asked them, so what is it that would take me to a place of salvation to non losing my salvation? What would I have to do? Right? Because listen, we can't start waging the height of, of, of sin over other sins. Sin, sin. Right? So any sin, you can't say, well, if you commit adultery, you lost your salvation. Well, okay. So what you're saying then is, because Jesus said that if I look upon another woman with, with lust in my heart, did I lose my salvation? Right? I mean, you've got to start playing through all that. Because really, I think the danger in that is, you know, the Bible says that you may know you have eternal life. Okay, it, that to me, that would tell me that I can never really know because I can never know, really know where I'm at. Like, we commit sin on a daily basis. Everybody does. Like, at what point do I lose my salvation? The next problem with that is, what is it if if I can lose my salvation, you have to then play the game of implying that there's something I had to do to gain it. And that's the problem with that. There's nothing I could do to gain salvation. Paul's very clear about that 
in, in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9. Uh, so, again, now, I understand why people will teach that <laughs> because, you know, you obviously don't want people getting saved and then just doing whatever the heck they want to do. That, that's not what God is looking for, right? Hence the reason why Paul consistently says, well, well should I continue in sin? God forbid, right? No, obviously that's not the, uh, you know, not what uh, a Christian should do. And so I understand why, but to me that's very, man, that becomes very, you know, that, here's my problem with, this is just me talking out loud to you. You do whatever you want with what I'm about to say, okay? Here's my problem with people that say you can lose your salvation and believe in Calvinism. Here's my problem with that. That's very arrogant and presumptuous to think that you're okay and everybody else can lose their salvation and everybody else didn't get picked. That's very, very arrogant in my opinion. And to me that flies in the very face of who God is. Listen, there's something to be said about that. There really is. Like if I'm going to stand up here and go, hey, listen, man, I don't know about all you, but I know God picked me. Isn't that kind of arrogant? Well, why did God pick you and not pick me? What's up with that, right? And, and, and if you think that you can lose your salvation, then my next question would be is, well, well, you can lose yours too then. What makes you think you're okay? You see what I'm saying? Now, not that I want to turn this into that, but it is 7.32 and I'm almost done with the message, so let's pick something to pick up on. <laughs> okay. I do want to explain to you how they get there, okay? The biggest verses that are used to teach you can lose your salvation, there are really two places they'll go. It, maybe three. Let's say three, okay? So let's look at each one of those real quick, and, and let's just, we're in Hebrews already, so we don't have to go very far to get to the first one. Track back to Hebrews 6. And let me show you what they'll, what they'll say. They'll say, look, look what it says here in verse number four, Hebrews 6, verse four, it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves to the Son of God afresh and put him uh, to open shame. Okay, so if someone was going to teach that you can lose your salvation, there's a verse they'll go to. Now, if you read just verse 4 through 6, boy, it does sound like someone can lose their salvation in there. Right? It does sound like that. But there's a couple things I want to take note of. One thing is, now, let's make sure we read what it says, because if a person lost their salvation, it says it's impossible for them to get it back. Is that not what it says in verse 6? If they fall away, it's impossible. So if somebody lost their salvation, well, that's it. They're done. It's impossible to get it back. So if that's actually saying what somebody's trying to make it say, well, that's it. Well, now what? <laughs> You're done. You're, you're, you're on your way to hell. See you later. Okay. Here's the good thing. <laughs> we got to put everything in context, right? Context is always important if we're going to understand a passage. Now, to put this passage in context, I would probably tell you, you might want to start in verse 1, not verse 4, okay? And in verse 1 it says, therefore... Okay, so right off the bat, because it says, therefore, what it now tells us is, before we can even understand the context of this passage, we got to go back to chapter 5 and find out what's going on in chapter 5, because he was explaining something in chapter 5 that led to what he's saying in chapter 6. Y'all with me on this? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, it's just pretty simple, uh, right? So look at verse uh, number 5. It says, uh, chapter 5. 
It says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that were able to save him from death, and was her in him that he feared, though he were a son, yet were he, he were obedient by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Okay, so, remember, what was the purchase price for eternal salvation? Okay, clearly in chapter 5, he's talking about salvation, because that's what he's talking about. You understand? Right? You just saw that, right? Everybody saw that? Okay, without having to read the rest of the chapter, go ahead and read the rest of it on your own time. You'll see, he then gets into chapter 6, and look what he says. Therefore, read those words. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. I'm no longer talking about the doctrine of Christ and salvation. Leaving those principles, now let's talk about this. Let us go on to perfection. Ah, so what he's talking about in chapter 6 is not salvation, and you can lose salvation. What he's talking about is lack of maturity, growing in Christ. That is, now that makes a whole lot more sense. And then when you read verse 4, 5, and 6, what he's saying is, hey, it's impossible. Once you accept Christ and his sacrifice for you, once you accept his blood for salvation, once you are saved and you've already, it's impossible to go back to that and, and redo what you already did. That's what he's saying. This is, and that makes a lot more sense because it fits the context of what he's talking about. Not, also to add to the trump while we're at it, this book was written to who? Hebrews. The Hebrews. If I was going to try to pull out the doctrine of salvation, I wouldn't go to the book of Hebrews to pull that out. Now, there are certainly stuff in this book that applies. And the reason why we know it applies, because we can trump it with what Paul said in, in, in the church epistles. Okay? But don't go there and start pulling out church doctrine when the book was written to the Hebrews. This book is actually a very tribulational book. It really is. And I personally believe that this book was meant for the Jew in the tribulation. Okay. But regardless of the point, it doesn't matter if you believe that or not. In context, very clear. He's no longer talking about salvation. He's now talking about perfection, maturity, growth. That's what he's talking about. All right, so everybody see that in Hebrews? Are we good there? Okay. That's one place that they'll go to. Another place that they'll go to is Matthew chapter 24. And again, if you just read it for what it says, uh, well, it certainly does seem to imply that you can lose your salvation. Matthew 24, verse number 13, uh, it says, uh, but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. Okay, so obviously what that's implying right there is that a person needs to endure to the end to be saved. And if at any point they don't, they can lose their salvation. Okay, it, 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 from that standpoint, if I just read verse 13, well, yeah, that would imply you can lose your salvation. Here's the problem, okay? This is why... Paul says, rightly divide the word of truth, because if you don't, you're going to start applying things to the wrong dispensation. Here's the issue with what's going on here. In chapter number 24, it's very clear that what Jesus is talking about is the tribulation. That's the period of time he's talking about. If you were to take chapter 24 and cross-reference it with Revelation chapter 6, you will see in the very order that the seals are released in Revelation chapter 6, Jesus is, is talking about what's going on. 
He's talking about the tribulation. Okay, well, now, here's the, here's the deal. In the tribulation period, do people get saved the same way they get saved now? Clearly, in the book of Revelation, the answer is no. Listen, I, I've studied the book of Revelation up, down, left, right, backwards. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I'm going to sit up here and tell you that I'm an expert on the book, but I'd like to think I can play with anybody on that one. I, 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 I'm pretty well read in the book of Revelation, for whatever that's worth, okay? And all I'm telling you is there are some very, very key things going on in Revelation that if you miss it, you are going to start applying stuff to the wrong people. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this, okay? In Revelation chapter number one, it told us that who was washed in the blood? Who? Who was? Right? We were, right? Isn't that what it says? The kings and priests? Clearly, if we go back to, to uh, uh, church doctrine, we'll see that we are, we are kings and priests, right? Okay, so clearly it says we, but, but notice what it says in Revelation 1. Go with me there, back to Revelation 1. I want to show you something real quick. I want to show you how, easily, how easy you can mess something up. Let me show you something real quick. Look at Revelation 1, 5, right? It says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and had made us kings and priests unto the God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Okay, so how was, when I got saved, and again, I know that he's talking to us because I can go back to church epistles to start to bring all this out. When I got saved, when I was redeemed, what washed my sins away? His blood did. That's what it says. So who, I was washed in the blood. Y'all with me? Okay, is that, is that what happens in the tribulation when a tribulation saint gets saved? The answer is no. Which implies, <laughs> if, you're, if you're thinking, well, salvation must be different. And it is, because we have now, and does somebody get the Holy Ghost indwell in them during the tribulation period? The answer is no. So can, is somebody sealed unto the day of redemption in the tribulation period? The answer is no. If somebody takes the mark of the beast in the tribulation period, I don't care what they did, I don't care what they believe, what happens to them? Do you understand? So, we got, we got to do something with all this. It's important that we do. I'm just trying to help you understand why some of this stuff gets taught. Okay, why would somebody teach that you can lose your salvation in the first place? Uh, maybe not every time, but I'm going to put my nudge. They probably think the church goes through the tribulation. They probably do. Because why they got there is because they went into tribulation passages and saw that someone could lose their salvation. And the reality is, you can. You do have to endure to the end. You cannot take the mark of the beast. The Bible's clear on that. But now let me, tell you, let me show you what happens to somebody that gets saved, and again, loosely saved, because you can lose your salvation in the tribulation. Because if you take that mark of the beast, you're done. Okay, but let me show you what happens to that person. Go to, go to Revelation 7. Now watch. <clears throat> So in Revelation 7, uh, uh, John uh, sees these, uh, 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 these people that came out of great tribulation. Look what he says here in verse 13. It says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto thee, uh, Actually, let's go, uh, yeah, that's fine. And, he, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where'd they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of and have their robes. All right, what's the difference? Their robes were washed. Back in Revelation 1.5, the church, what was washed? I was washed. In, in, in the tribulation, what gets washed? 
The rogues do. Do you see the difference? That's different. That's a very identifiable difference that you have to do something with. You cannot just go, oh, well, well, you know. No, 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 there's no, oh, well, you know. Why would he say it the way he said it? It's because there's something different going on. That's why. They were not washed in the blood of the Lamb because the Holy Spirit does not indwell them in the, in the it, it, he couldn't. Do you get it? He couldn't. Do you understand? Now, all that helps us understand something else, which is obviously very important. The church does not go through the tribulation. <laughs> okay? Do <laughs> you see why all this stuff matters? It really does. You really got to read what it says. Because if you don't, mm, man, you can run yourself into a little bit of trouble. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but at the same time, there's a reason why God says what he says the way he says it. And, and you, if we can just be okay with that, and, and listen, here's the other part of all that. We have to be okay with, you know what? Maybe I was wrong about that. You know, why is that so bad? Why can't God just be right and every man a liar? You know, you know how many times I've had to go, you know, I don't know if I was right about that. <laughs> I think maybe, well, I mean, I'm reading what that says right there. Boom, well, I guess I'm going to have to change my mind on that one. We've got to be okay with that. Okay. So Matthew 24, uh, number one, right, it's clearly a tribulation passage. When we go through the book of Revelation, I will drown that baby home for you all day long. Obviously, it's a very clear tribulation passage. Here's the other thing about that, too, though, is, again, who was the book of Matthew written to? The Jew. For what purpose? To prove that Jesus is Messiah, the King of Israel. Don't go to Matthew and start pulling church doctrine. You're going to run yourself into trouble. And there's a bunch of places in Matthew where you will run yourself into trouble if you don't understand that. Now, again, be mindful. All Scripture is written for our learning. All Scripture has application. All Scripture does not apply to us. Does that make sense? Okay, so again, Matthew, so I wouldn't go to Hebrews, and I wouldn't go to Matthew because you are talking about tribulation stuff. Something different's going on in tribulation. And I would agree that somebody in the tribulation can lose their quote-unquote salvation because it's different. Something's going... Personally, I think what probably happens is it reverts back to the way things were uh, in the, in, before Christ died on the cross when Jesus came to present himself as Messiah because that's really what the tribulation's about. It's presenting himself as Messiah to the Jew. It's the, it's the 70th week of Daniel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It, it, the tribulation, please understand this, the tribulation literally absolutely has nothing to do with the church. Zero. Nothing to do with the church. It has everything to do with the Jew. Everything. It starts when the church is removed. It, make, it just makes a lot of sense when you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. The final place that they'll go to, and the, 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 when I say the final place, I'm saying the big ones, okay? They try to revert, subvert some other scriptures that I don't agree with how they do it, but here's the other one, Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one, where it says uh, in verse number four, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And so what they'll do in, in that area is, is they don't understand and they don't properly grab on to the definition of what predestination actually means. Now, Obviously, this is very, also very much tied into what Calvinism tries to teach, right? This is a big Calvinistic verse they'll go to. See? We were predestined. Here's the, here's the, here's the reality, my friends, okay? Read the passage. <laughs> what was predestined? The church was predestined, not us. 
the us becomes ye in verse what? 13? In whom ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, again, uh, just applying things and putting them in their, in their proper context solves all the problems. Right? Uh, when we went through the book of Ephesians, we really broke that down quite a bit. But anyways, uh, I, I hope that helps you uh, for whatever it's worth. So in summary, in summary, the precious blood of Christ did and does the following. A, it purchased the church. B, it bought, uh, brought justification. C, it brought reconciliation. D, it brought propitiation. E, it brought sanctification. F, it brought redemption. G, it washes the believer. H, it cleanses the believer. I, it makes the believer nigh. Uh, and J, it gives the believer peace. So, uh, uh, all of that is tied into redemption. That's a lot of stuff right there. This is why understanding redemption and getting it biblically correct is vitally important. You got to make sure we get this thing right. We can't make this mess this up. How about this? The two ordinances of the church also speak of Christ's redemptive work. The first, baptism, shows his death to sin and the believer's identification with him. Um, we could go to Revelation, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6 and just read the whole chapter. And we'll see where that all plays into redemption. But then how about the Lord's Supper? The broken bread uh, of the Lord's Supper represents his, his body. And the, and the blood uh, uh, is represented by the fruit of the vine. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, Matthew 26 verse uh, 26 through 29 talks about how his body would be broken and, and his blood is for the New Testament, for many the remission of sin. And then in Romans 6, uh, again, he talked about uh, this idea of know you not, how you are baptized into Christ and baptized into his death, uh, buried with him, ba baptism, and he goes through and he talked about how we were planted in his likeness and in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man is crucified with him. So again, both ordinances of the church, you know, you have to ask, you know, of all the things God could have put as ordinances, why did he pick these two? Well, because both of them speak of redemption. Amen? Amen? The believer's response and responsibility. The believer must remember that since Christ has bought him, he is no longer his own. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, right? We were bought with a price. Uh, and of course, now we know what that price was. And if you didn't know, you should know. By the way, uh, that price is worth far is far worth far above rubies. Uh, Proverbs thirty one ten. If I'm right on that, right? Uh, rubies, of course, are red, <laughs> right? He's talking about the virtuous woman. Her price is far above rubies. Uh, listen, it's because of the blood that was purchased that purchased that virtuous woman. He is not to do what he desires with his body, but what his owner desires. Every Christian is a steward of his own body, and God will judge him according to the works that he performs in it. It is God's will that he glorify his Redeemer with a holy and obedient life. That is redemption. Uh, obviously, a very key uh, uh, doctrine in the uh, in, in understanding salvation, um, without without a doubt, um, you know probably the two. Again, I hate putting importances on anything, but I would say the three really important salvation stuff that really ties the whole all of salvation together, all eight of them together, is regeneration, uh, reconciliation, and redemption really make sure you grab onto those three. And then if you grab onto those three, the other five are all connected 
to those three, and then, of course, you know, hence the reason why we're going through all eight of them uh, for whatever that's worth. All right, uh, so that's it for this week. Um, we will, uh, Lord willing, uh, we will pick up for the last one next, uh, next Wednesday, uh, and we'll be done with our, huh?